Thanks, mate. Hey, good morning, everyone. Great to see you. Smiling and I think I've thawed out now, which is good. Yeah, if you ever want to thaw out, come and stand in front of these stage lights and that'll, that'll get you going in no time. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, it's great to celebrate. There's, there's been a few birthdays this week, which is always, always a joy. Um, Tom sends his love. Tom and Sue, they will be back with us uh, next week, uh, which is exciting. They've had a fantastic time away uh, in the States, uh, visiting their family over there, and that's great. And we look forward to welcoming them back uh, to beautiful Melbourne uh, this time uh, next week. And before we get to our, our message for this morning, I just want to take a moment. I think it's an important practice to reflect back to the previous week uh, because there's so much richness that happens each time we gather and to not just skip over it but to remember. Uh, to read Jog Your Memory, Ollie was up here and he was talking about essentially the importance of sharing our burdens and carrying each other's burdens. And there are times where our responsibility is to share and there are times where our responsibility is to carry. And you can't carry unless someone's shared, and you, 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 and you can't be carried unless you share, right? Yeah, and so I wanted you just to consider in this last week what that looks like in the big or in the very mundane small, how you've actually gone, hey, I need help with this little thing or this really big thing, or how you've actually seen someone and recognized someone and taken an opportunity to go, hey, I can help out in that and blessed another. Yeah, I encourage you. Don't, don't forget these things that we talk about on a Sunday morning, but, but instill them into your practices of, of a weekly rhythm and then, and then come back to them periodically. Yeah, that's something I'm wanting to do more and more as a church is to actually just kind of revisit things um, week, week after week. Galatians 6, thanks Paris for reading that. Galatians 6 verses 7 to 10 for those that didn't grab it. Pull it up in front of you. We've got four whole verses for some morning. Four whole verses verses to look at. And we're going to do the very logical uh, thing and start with verse 9 and then look at verse 10 and then we'll go back and do 7 and 8. And the reason being not that there's anything particularly special about the order, I, I just felt compelled to emphasize verse 7 and 8 and it seems fitting to do that. So um, I'll run you through what verse we're going to do. We're going to do one at a time um, and it will be, it'll be great. Verse 9, let us not grow weary of doing good. Hey, mate. Let us not grow weary of doing, doing good. This, out of all the verses, was the one that took me the longest to get my head around. You could spend an entire message, and it would be fitting to spend an entire message. You could do a whole series, in fact, on this verse. Let us not grow weary of doing good. The first time I read it, in fact, the first like 15, 20 times I read it, I read it as, let us not stop doing good. The emphasis for me was on the doing, on the outcome of doing good. I missed, though, and it wasn't until I was in bed one night and I was thinking about it and it was just like, oh, I get it now, right? I had one of those 50 moments. The emphasis is on, let us not grow weary. For if we don't grow weary, we'll continue to have the opportunity to do good. good. It's really hard to do good if we're in a state of weariness. Weariness here, I'm not talking about just being a little bit tired at the end of the day. That's normal kind of human function. I'm talking about a deep seated, a deep-rooted kind of exhaustion, almost to a chronic kind of state over a long, pronounced period of time where just everything seems so hard. That's where the emphasis is on. It's not on the outcome of what you do, but on how you actually tend to your own well-being. Let us not grow weary is the encouragement here, not the command. That's where the focus should be. And so the question that we should ask as we consider this verse, let us not grow weary of doing good, is how are we encouraging practices in our life that encourage the opposite? Vibrancy, richness, life-giving things. And what are the places that are causing me to become weary? Why am I experiencing a weariness within my body physically, within my kind of heart emotionally, within my soul spiritually, within my mind mentally. We can experience it in all these facets, or sometimes they're all interconnected. Where is it coming from? Is it a lack of life-giving presence? Is it an overbalance of too much output and not enough input? Is it you're just carrying too heavy a load? You're just overcommitted in life, and you actually need to learn to say no to some things. You've been doing that for a long, long period of time, and that will build a sense of, of weariness. Is it an unmet expectation or desire, or too much 
expectation or desire that someone else has of you or, or that you have of yourself. Weariness is really important. The reality is it doesn't accrue overnight. Sometimes we, we snap, we have those moments where we hit breaking point and we think, man, today was so tiring. But, but when we're in a state of weariness, that's not a one-day thing. It's kind of the straw that breaks the, the camel's back or whatever the, the expression is, right? It's in that moment that we realize, man, for the last six months I've been pedaling so hard and I'm just cooked. It doesn't accrue overnight, and just like it doesn't accrue overnight, it doesn't disappear overnight either. It, when we're talking about a state of, of deep weariness, of crushing constant exhaustion, of unchanging fatigue, that will take a long time to go away. And so, um, whilst I say, we, we could spend the whole message, I, I didn't uh, choose to spend the whole message here today, I wanted to acknowledge and say, this is really important, really, really actually quite, quite important. I've lived this experience, both the good side of living a life of rich vibrancy and living a life of weariness at different points. And if you find yourself in a place of, of deep weariness, you're like, oh my goodness, that just seems like me right now, then I'm okay if you zone out for the rest of the message, right? If that's all that you need to hear today, that's okay. And here's my encouragement to you. Don't do that journey alone. Okay, find someone. I'd be very happy to talk through and, and just go into to this in, in depth and hear your story and, and journey along, pray with you. I'd be also delighted if you just found someone that you can trust, or even someone you don't know, to say, hey, I just need to share something with you. I need someone else to go on this journey. Don't do it alone. You need help, and that's actually a beautiful thing. That's not a weak thing. That's a, a beautiful thing. So if that's you, please hear me. This is, this is really important. That's what I'm going to talk about it for now, but, but I, I want to stress that. Um, let us not do weary of doing good. The reality is that as we are rich and vibrant in life, the outcome will be that we will, we will do good things. That will, that will happen. Verse 10. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those in the household of faith. The first half of the verse. So then, as we have opportunity. There are two ways to understand this phrase. We can understand it on, on face value. As we have opportunities, it's kind of a passive understanding. As opportunities present themselves to us, as they crop up in front of us, as someone reaches out for something, we, oh, there's an opportunity. We could understand it like that. Or we could understand it, and I think this is how we should understand it, when we, when we look at some of the Greek behind it. The better translation I would suggest is, so then, as we have time, we recognize that we not just have a passive responsibility when things crop up to us, but we actually have an active responsibility to engage in things that it would say, let us do good to everyone. So as we have time, the reality is time is a human experience. If we are alive, we have time. To live is to have time. We actually have the same amount of time today, believe it or not. We had the same amount of time yesterday. Now, we have different capacities and different energy levels and different responsibilities and so forth, so our, our distribution of time will look different, and that, that's fitting. But we are alive as human beings, and therefore, we have been given by God time. So as we have time, because we're alive, what does it mean to live the Christian life? We're alive, we have time, therefore, let us seek actively to do good to everyone. That's what it's saying here. Don't be a kind of passive in waiting for opportunities to come up, but seek out opportunities where you can bless another. And then it goes on to say, especially those who are in the household of faith. And I've always wondered why, why in particular, talking about those within, within the Christian community, what, what's going on there? And then I think about John 13. This is Jesus talking. He says, a new commandment I give you. Jesus is very familiar with all the Old Testament commandments. He said, I'm, I'm giving you a new one to add to your list. And this one actually will override the other ones. It will fulfill the other ones. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And here's the catch. By this, in other words, by loving each other as Jesus loved us, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. 
So why are these specially to those in the household of faith? Because when we manifest the love of God, that actually is our Christian witness. People see that and they recognize, wow, that, that's different. There's something remarkable about that person. They get to experience the love of Jesus himself. Um, in our, our boys' life group uh, that I lead with the young adults, which is, which is great, we, we kind of have a couple of questions each week that we like to go back to. And, and one of them that we periodically um, come back to is, is a question actually from my, my Donmel uh, school days. How have I lived beyond myself this week? The idea being we can get so caught up in our own little world and our responsibilities at work and our responsibilities at home, and they are really good and important things to to do well. But how have I lived beyond myself this week? How have I actually intentionally blessed someone that's outside of my normal scope of responsibility? So for me, as a pastor, on Friday night at youth, for example, I, I should encourage the kids, right? That's within my normal scope of responsibility to do. But, for example, if I bumped into someone at the shops... That's, that's not in my normal scope. I could very easily be like, oh, cabbage, this looks very interesting, right? And you can all, but, but I have an opportunity then to go, hey, how could I bless that person outside of my normal scope? How have I lived beyond myself this week, beyond my normal role to bless someone in a particular way? It doesn't have to be a big thing. Here's a couple of examples if you're stuck for ideas. Um, today, you're going to go home and you're going to eat food at some point today, whether it be lunch or dinner. You could share that food with somebody else. That would be a great thing to do. And if for you, cooking is a daunting thing to share with somebody else, right? I understand that. My cooking is not amazing. If you can't cook, we've talked about this before, if you can't cook, you can kettle, right? You can turn on the kettle and extend the blessing, the living beyond yourself of hospitality towards another. Say, hey, come, dwell in my presence, and let's just share some time chatting. And I'll extend the blessing of just hearing some of your stories from the week. Hearing some of these stories from your life. Hearing some of your hopes and your dreams for the future. Um, It's winter. And it's the end of term two. If you think of a a perfect time for parents to be at their wit's end with children, this would be an appropriate time for parents, right? What if you said to them, hey, I'll take the kids for an afternoon and take them to the park. And you can, you can have a nap if you want to. You, know, like, you, can go, you can have some quality time together, or you can go and do a recreational activity that you enjoy, right? You, and you just get to go for a little wander with the kids and play in the park, or you get to sit and watch a movie with them, or whatever, whatever it might be. That would be a fantastic way to, to live beyond yourself, to do good to those in the household of faith. Um, you could, and I love this practice, and it's a practice quite frequent in our church. When you're cooking in your household, say you cook for two people in your household, you could cook for three. If you have three people in your household, you cook for four. If you have four in your household, you could cook for five, right? And with that extra portion, you come and, like I say, it's a very frequent practice. You could drop it in the care net freezer. And then someone that has a burden, like we were talking about last week, can come and they don't have to cook this week. What a beautiful gift that is. Um, you could call someone on your way home from work. This is one that I, I quite like to do. You're driving home from work. The chances are someone else is also driving home from work. You're sitting and listening to the radio. Chances are someone else is listening to the radio, right? Perfectly fine. Nothing wrong with that. But you could pick up your phone safely on Bluetooth, right? Legally, right? And you could just call and check in. How was your day? What happened, what happened today? How, how are your kids if they've got kids? You know, how is such and such going? Just ask some questions. Check in on, on them. It doesn't have to be a long, a long call at all. My, my best mate lives yeah, a very, very long way away. Yeah, too long for my liking. Yeah, but we do that uh, frequently. We'll, we'll just call it. And sometimes we'll miss each other, and, and that's okay, like ships in the night. Yeah, but, but we just make a regular practice of, of doing that. You're already going to spend the time sitting in the car, so you can seize the opportunity. Another one in the car, and this is the last on my list. There's, there's 100 that you do. I, I like the practice of when you see someone stopped on the side of the road with their hazards on, safely again, Peel over and just check in on them, right? Because sometimes they're just peeled over because they've got a phone call or something or their kids need to go to the toilet or whatever it might be, right? Sometimes it's like totally fine. You check in, oh, no, no, I'm fine. And you keep going, right? Day moves on like normal. But sometimes they, there might be experience where they're like, oh, I've just punctured my tire and I've got no idea how to change a tire. And, and that prospect is terrifying. So they're going to spend three hours sitting there waiting for a tow truck to come and their day is like totally ruined. Whereas if you know how to change a tire, you can be like, oh, Dude, I'll I'll help you. In fact, I'll show you. I'll teach you, right? And and you have a moment just to do that together. And by that, they are experiencing the gospel of Jesus because you're demonstrating that right now you are important to me. 
Yeah, always going on in my given day, kind of like Jesus, right? Jesus was walking through, I think it was Jericho, and he spots Zacchaeus in the tree. I was going on in my day. Jesus didn't plan on stopping and having lunch with Zacchaeus that day, but he saw him. He saw the person with the broken down tire, and he says, you're important. There's an opportunity to bless and love you here, and I'm going to spend 15 minutes to, to do that. And then you get dirty hands, and you get a cool story to tell for the rest of the day, right? It's great. As we have the opportunity, or as we have time, because we're alive, we have time, let us continue to do good. We already do it. Let us continue to do it to those, especially in the household of faith. That is verse 10. Verse 7. Whatever one sows, that he will also reap. John Stott uh, has a beautiful quote on this verse. Sow a thought, it's a bit of a tongue twister, right? Sow a thought, reap an act. Sow an act, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. Whatever one sows, that he will also reap. I see this with students. I, I work at, at Donvale uh, Christian College. And I work predominantly with Year 12 students. Uh, most of, of them decide at the start of Year 12 that they want to get, for whatever, whatever number that would be for them, a good ATAR. They have a particular goal in mind. That seed of thought is planted at the beginning of the year when we sit down at our, our first day of classes. Naturally, there are some that act on that thought. They make conscious decisions. They develop good study habits. They learn to say no to things that might distract them, like late nights or whatever it might be from their study. They ask for extra help and extra work from their teachers. They get good feedback. They're thought at the start of the year of desiring a good ATAR takes action. And these actions then develop into habits throughout the year. And then the result of that is that a destiny, as it were, I don't particularly like that word, it's a bit extreme for a year 12 ATAR, but their destiny in that respect is that they get, generally, a, a school that they're inclined to be, be pleased with. The flip side is also true. You get some kids, they have a thought seed at the start, and they go, wow, I'd love to you mean, get this number, and then they get into week two, and then that thought's like disappeared. They don't act on it. Whatever one sows, that he will also reap. Sow a thought, reap an act. Sow an act, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. I see this with athletes I train with. You can jump to, jump to the next slide there, Richie. Athletes that I, I train with, um, that's, that's one particular athlete that I train with there uh, in the middle. Um, that's not actually, it's Usain Bolt for those that don't know, I've never trained with him. Yeah, but that is me as a very young man um, with some beautiful Justin Bieber hair. Um, I, I see this with athletes that I train with, I, I do train with, with a, lot of, a lot of athletes. And the guys that I train with, they all have a particular goal in mind. It might be a particular time that they're shooting for. It might be a particular place that they're shooting for. It might be to, to get a certain, certain level of, of accomplishment. They all have a thought seed in their mind. The difference between those that achieve their thought seed and those that don't achieve their thought seed or their goal is the ones that choose to get up early when it's raining, like some morning, and it's cold, and they train when it would be much easier to stay in bed. Or the ones that get into the gym because they know gym work is important for developing a strong you mean, joints and, and hips and muscles to prevent injuries so they can train more. Or those that, that go to bed early and develop good diet habits so their body is fueled and ready to manage with the training. Right? On the flip side, there's also those that, that would love to run X amount of, of speed or jump X amount of height or do whatever it might be in a particular competition, but it stays as a thought seed. They don't act on it. They don't develop habits and rhythms and disciplines over, over a long, long period of time in order to achieve it. And so come race day, the destiny is somewhat inevitable. Now, sometimes there's surprises, right? Generally, those that have developed the thought seed into actions, into habits, result in a destiny of performing in the way that they want to or, or not. Whatever one sows, that he will also reap. Sow a thought reap an act, sow an act, reap a habit, sow a habit, reap a character, sow a character, reap a destiny. I see this in my marriage. Five years ago, actually five years and a week ago today, I stood here and Bella stood here and we pronounced to each other our vows. This was a thought seed of committing to a rich, vibrant, growing, healthy marriage. 
That was our desire. That was our vow. That was our promise to one another. But at that stage, it was just a thought seed. As you know, if you are married, if you do not act on that, it will not just magically happen. And so in the last five years, I've made conscious decisions, actions, to see this thought seed flourished. Be it in words of encouragement, little compliments here and there, cuddles on the couch, dishes washing when I'm tired. These thoughts became actions. These actions became habits. They became part of our, our routines and rhythm. And the destiny is that we have a rich and vibrant marriage. And there are also flip tides, so times where the flip side is also true. The cost or the sacrifice is too much. I just can't be bothered because I feel lazy, whatever it might be. And the consequence or my destiny, as it were, when I sow to those kind of behaviors is that our marriage feels distant or challenging or just irritating or grating towards one another. Whatever we sow to, we will reap. Sow a thought, reap an act. Sow an act, reap a habit. You're kind of getting it by now, aren't you? Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. Lastly, And most intimately, I see this with my own soul. Once again, there was a big black tub just about there, September 15th, 2013. 11 years ago now, a couple of years prior to that, I had already at some point made a commitment to follow Jesus. A thought seed had been planted that, yes, for the rest of my entire life, I want to learn what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, to love him, to experience his love for me and walk with him. It was just a thought seed, and it was beautiful. But until the actions followed, until the habits followed, it would just remain a thought seed. Until I committed in my adolescence to say no to the drinking culture that enveloped many of my friends and led them in a particular direction in life, until I committed every week. It wasn't an option, do I go to church on a Sunday? No, it was, I go to church on Sunday. That was a statement of fact, not a question for me. That would grow my faith. I made a habit of reading scripture as a teenager. I remember printing out one of those Bible plans that has all the verses and all the numbers and slowly one by one ticking through. Not just the really nice parts of scripture that I enjoy reading, but the hard parts of scripture that didn't really make a lot of sense to me. But the discipline and the practice was important in my growing and following Jesus. These actions, as I engaged with them, became habits and became rhythms of life. And so it birthed this beautiful relationship with the Lord. And then, of course, at flip times, flip times, uh, on the flip side, at times, the opposite was also true. There would be times where I'd be so busy or so distracted or so caught up in fleshly temptations or seeking the attention of others, whatever my golden cow might be, these things also birthed actions. They birthed habits. They birthed rhythms of life. And their destiny was that at times my walk with the Lord was distant absent even. My prayers, they just felt empty. Whether we think about students, whether we think about athletes, whether we think about marriages, whether we think about our very own soul, there is a hundred more that we could list there. The truth remains, whatever one sows, that he will also reap. Sow a thought, reap an act. Sow an act, reap a habit, sow a habit, reap a character, sow a character, reap a destiny. Verse 8. For the one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. This is not a new thought. We've talked about this many times already in the book of Galatians. A couple of weeks ago, uh, we talked about the illustration of a cup and a sponge, two different cups. One cup was oil and one cup was water and a sponge that goes in each. And if we think about the Spirit or a life investing in the Spirit as the cup of oil, and we think about the life of the flesh as a cup of water, as I soak in the oil, the Spirit, the, the ways of the Spirit, and my relationship with the Spirit, they become more attractive to me. In scientific terms, it's called hydrophilic attraction. Like attracts like. The, the oil desires for more oil. And conversely, I am repulsed by the things of the flesh. I have this hydrophobic uh, repulsion from it. I'm less inclined to desire those things. As I soak in the Spirit, I'm more inclined to desire more of the Spirit. As I soak in the flesh, I'm inclined to desire more of the flesh. We've we've talked about this before. What are ways that we're soaking to the Spirit? What are ways that you are soaking to the flesh? 
Here's a few particular thoughts that might be helpful. John Tyson, I'm not sure if you've heard of him. He writes this beautiful book, I actually really quite appreciated it, called Beautiful uh, Resistance. His premise is quite simple. It's actually based upon a story of Bonhoeffer. I can tell you the full story later on. But Bonhoeffer makes this line of this, the spiritual life, the cup of oil, as it were, must be stronger than that the fleshly life, and the life of the culture and the world around us. And he comes up with these lists of different contrasting practices. And I'm sorry, it's a little bit blurry there, but I'll read them out for you so you can, you can hear them. He says, worship must resist idolatry. This must be greater than that. Rest must resist exhaustion. We must soak in rest rather than engaging constantly in exhaustion. Hunger for the Lord and for His kingdom must resist apathy. I, I wonder if that one is the greatest killer of our Western church. To be honest, I really do. Hunger must resist apathy. I see a lot of apathy conquers hunger. Hospitality must resist fear. Honor must resist contempt. Love must resist hate. Sacrifice must resist privilege. And celebration must resist Cynicism, that's probably my one to work on, that bottom one. In other words, we must learn to live differently. This has to be stronger than that. We must sow seeds, seeds of worship, seeds of spiritual hunger, seeds of rest, seeds of hospitality, seeds of honour, of love, of sacrifice, of celebration. We must sow seeds that reflect the spiritual life of Jesus, the way Jesus lives and encourages us to live. And in time, we will reap the destiny of that. A life in close proximity with the Father. And a life that becomes more and more attractive the more we sow to it. This must be stronger than that. The one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Acts 4.13, one of those kind of narrative verses that you can easily slip over, but is quite profound. It's talking about Peter and John standing before a crowd, and they see them, and they go, these guys are just normal, common men. But they were astonished at them. Why? It says, because they recognized that they had been with Jesus. In other words, they recognized that Peter and John were known by Jesus. They knew Jesus. How? Well, because they'd come like Jesus. How? Because Peter and John had a thought seed that was planted in in them by Jesus when he says, Come, follow me. The thought seed was planted, but they then acted on that. They created habits and rhythms. They committed their entire life to the outworking of that thought seed. That was planted by Jesus. It meant nothing until they acted on it. They constantly had to learn to choose the spirit life this over the flesh life that. They were not perfect. But they had sown thoughts, actions, habits of spiritual seeds and were now witnessing spiritual fruit or their destiny. You might be thinking, we've heard this sermon before, Aaron. And like I said, you are correct. You are very correct, in fact. And we've actually only got two more weeks of of Galatians, so you've only got two more weeks of hearing this message. But here's the kicker. It can be easy to go, I've heard it all before, and to zone out, to know it theoretically. But I want you to think, do I live this out? Does my life reflect this reality? If Paul's made this plea over and over and over again in Galatians, it must be because it's really, really important. And so have I responded to what Paul, through the Spirit, so really the Spirit's desire is for me? Am I different because of our time in Galatians? Or more specifically, how am I different because of our time in Galatians? Are my thoughts different? Are my actions different? Are my habits different? Is my character different? Is my destiny, as it were, different? And if not, what would it look like to choose to live differently? Not in the grandeur of the amazing kind of, I mean, go and and be a monk and live in a cave. We have realities and lives and, and, and spaces to engage with, but to choose one practice, to say no to one fleshly thing and instead engage in one spiritual practice this week. 
You might want to think, in what ways am I still living by the flesh? And then choose a practice that would counter that. Or you might want to think, in what ways am I sowing to the Spirit? And in what ways can I continue to engage in that? Both would be good things to think about. The point is, I don't want you to miss this. To hear it and go, that was really lovely, Aaron. Thanks for your message. And then move on tomorrow and it be normal again. I really can't stress that enough. It's so important to put feet to our ears. Any student who just gets, any student who wants to get a good grade but never takes action will never get it. Any athlete who wants to win a race but never trains and disciplines himself will never get it. Any marriage that wants to be vibrant and rich but doesn't practice the things that make her marriage vibrant and rich will never experience the joy of that. And the same is true of our own soul. When we say we want to follow Jesus but we don't enact a life that reflects that, we won't experience the joy of that walk. Next week's our final week in Galatians. We'll then preach on something else. We'll then miss something else. So I want you this week, this is, this is your homework task from Mr. McKenzie. I want you to create some time, as you have time this week, create some time, create an opportunity. It could be on your way to work when you're driving, just in the quiet. It could be to get up you know, 15 minutes earlier in the morning and create the discipline for it. It might be when you're having a cup of tea in the afternoon, whatever it might be. Create a space and time to reflect on some of these questions, to assess your life, to look at your life and go, God, where am I living still according to the flesh? Because I guarantee you there'll be some ways in which you are, right? Because if you're not, you're Jesus. And I'm pretty sure none of us are quite there yet, right? I guarantee you this will be an example. Where am I still living according to the flesh? Where's that coming from? What's behind that? And how are you calling me to respond to that? This week, one really specific example. And then next week, it's the same question. Next week, it's the same question. And on the flip side, where am I sowing to the Spirit? Or what practice am I missing that I maybe have never engaged with that Jesus encourages us to engage with? What would it look like to give it a crack this week? And chances are it's not going to be profound and miraculous, but it will be one little step in the right direction. I tell you with my training, most training sessions are not miraculous. Most training sessions I don't suddenly you know, pull out these amazing times or performances. Most of the time they're just pretty mundane. And the spiritual life is like that. It's this beautiful joy of the mundane reality of daily engaging in these practices. So there you go. There's your challenge this week, to put feet to our ears of what we're, we've been hearing in Galatians and to not miss it before we move, move on. Can I pray for us? Pray, pray with me, please. Father, I'm perplexed by life, to be honest. It's a very strange thing as I think about it. It's a journey, it's an invitation. Some days are great, some days are really hard. And yet in each moment, whether it's when we're gathered as a church family or when we're scattered in our various places around the suburbs and the regions of Eltham, I recognise that your call is still the same. Come, follow me. Learn from me my yoke. Learn from me, as the scriptures say, the unforced rhythms of grace. And so we want to be people that not by, by sheer willpower or strength enact this, but we want to be people that are desiring more of your spirit. And as we sit with that thought, the actions and the behaviors flow forth. So would you plant a, a thought seed of an action that we can take this week. One little step. Give us the courage if that's what we need. Grant us the patience if that's what we need. The self-discipline if that's what we need. Help us in this, Father, I pray. For I know this is your desire, that we walk by the Spirit. And we want this to become our desire too. Thanks for this time together. It's always a blast. Amen.